This is AP Biology, Chapter 11, The Control of Gene Expression. And what we're focusing on now is the actual genetics and how we control what proteins are made through transcription and translation. So one of the big ethical issues that we talk about later in this chapter in a separate video is about cloning, the ethics behind it. And we'll address that in the use of stem cells in the other video. Now, one of the things that I want to focus on in this video is how do we control genes or the expression of genes, which means how do we make genes into proteins? And what we have known by studying bacteria, um, especially like E. coli, one of the things we know is that proteins that interact or play a role in our DNA. So proteins interacting with DNA are what determine whether or not that DNA gets expressed as a gene, so whether it goes through transcription and translation. In order to understand that, we need to look at how DNA is set up in some of the best known examples there are. So in prokaryotic cells, so again in bacteria, there are these things called operons, and they're very, very important when we look at them as a whole. So here is an operon, and if we look at how DNA is set up, so here's our genes, and in front of our gene we have an operator, and in front of the operator, we have a section of DNA called the promoter. And then right before the promoter, we have a separate gene that is a regulatory gene. And what happens is that the regulatory gene, when goes through transcription and translation, makes a protein that then interacts with and controls the operon or the operator for the genes that follow that segment. So the regulatory gene makes protein that then binds to the operator for the other set of genes that follow it. One of the best known operators or operons is the LAC operon. And so what we can see here is two very clear examples. So here's our regulatory gene. We're going to express that gene and create a protein, which is a repressor. Now, this protein is a repressor, so this protein binds to the DNA operator. And in doing so, it prevents RNA polymerase from being able to fit and bind at the promoter region because that's where RNA polymerase binds. If RNA polymerase can't bind to the promoter, it cannot transcribe the genes that follow that promoter, and thereby we don't make the RNA. We can't make the protein for those genes. Now, this is what happens with the LAC operon. When there's no lactose in our body, the active repressor is made, and it's bound to the operator. As soon as we put lactose into our body, what happens is that the lactose binds to this protein, altering its shape. Now that the shape has been altered, what happens is it can no longer bind to the operator, and it falls off. With the repressor gone from the operator, RNA polymerase can come in, bind to the promoter, and then we can transcribe the genes that follow that region, which then will be translated into making the enzymes, which in this case break down lactose. So as soon as lactose enters our body, we lose our repressor and we begin making the genes necessary for the digestion and breakdown of lactose. There's another kind of operon, and that's the trip operon. Now, it functions differently, so we have to memorize the LAC operon and then the trip operon. And what's going on in the trip operon is the exact opposite. When there's tryptophan present in our body, we are actively repressing by binding to that operator, whereas when there's no tryptophan in our body, the repressor is not the correct shape and it's unable to bind to the operator. So by looking at these, what we can see is, is that we can control what things are being expressed or what genes are being made based on the production of other genes. Now, multicellular eukaryotic organisms all have the same DNA in their cells. Whether you're a toe cell or a liver cell or a heart cell or a brain cell, you have the same DNA. Why do they have different jobs? Why do they function differently? That's because they're making different types of genes. They're making different types of proteins. Therefore, they act differently. And so we find out that these eukaryotic cells become specialized because they're going to make different genes. And how do we control that? That's where those operons come into play. Now, for example, if here's your muscle cell, which looks insanely different from a pancreatic cell, which is even different from a blood cell. Now, why do these cells all look different? They look different because they're making different types of genes.
Now, the thing about differentiated cells is just because you become a heart cell or a muscle cell, it doesn't mean that you've given up any of your DNA. It just means that you're not making proteins from that type of DNA. And so it turns out that differentiated cells retain all of their genetic potential as if they were a original stem cell. Now, if we were to take, let's say, um, the root of a carrot plant and we were to culture it correctly, make it just one cell, we could actually grow an entirely new plant. Whereas you would say one root cell should just make more root cells, that's normally the case. However, if you take it out of its environment and say, hey, you're just a cell now, let's regrow a whole carrot, it can do that. How do we control what DNA gets turned in or what DNA is being expressed? Well, it turns out that the way DNA is structured determines how genes get expressed or what proteins get made. And the DNA packaging is insanely, insanely efficient. So chromosomes contain DNA wrapped around a special type of protein called a histone protein. And those histone proteins basically make a bead-like structure of DNA. So if we look at this diagram, here's our double-stranded helix, and we're wrapping it around these tiny little purple balls, which are the histone proteins. When we wrap that around, what we end up making is these little bit of group kind of clusters, and we call them nucleosomes. So the DNA is wrapping really tightly around it, much like string around a ball. And we keep it nice and organized. We stack all these together. We compact it. And then that makes the chromosome that we often look at and see through a microscope. Now, this chromosome gets further wound and further folded until basically we're preventing the access of any polymerases to do transcription for the DNA. And so by having DNA package, when we do, let's say, cell division, we ensure that we're not actually trying to make genes right then. We're, we're looking at the fact that we just want to have it as organized as possible so that we can pass it on. Now, one of the big things about in females is that they have two X chromosomes. And we only need one chromosome to be doing all of the gene expression to make a female a female. So all those X-linked sex chromosome genes. We don't want to make we don't want to make copies of a both X chromosomes. That would be too many of those genes. And so one of the coolest examples that you can see very easily is in um, these cats. And here's what happens. When you have your early embryo, you get two different X chromosomes. And let's say in the calico cat, there's the allele for orange and the allele for black. So you inherit one of each. Well, what happens is that in the adult population, so as the cells have divided, they randomly, the cells randomly pick one of the X chromosomes to inactivate. And by inactivating it, what they do is they compact it so much that it's not able to undergo transcription and translation. Well, some cells may inactivate the allele, the chromosome that has the allele for the black so that the orange fur looks, the fur looks orange. And in another cell right next to it, it may have randomly selected to inactivate the orange color and so the black gets expressed. And so if you look at a calico cat, you'll actually see some hairs are orange and some hairs are black and it's completely random and that's because of the way the inactivation happens. Now, What's going on is when we look at transcription and translation, these are the processes that make the proteins that determine what genes or gene expression has occurred for a cell. It turns out there's a lot of controls that are happening inside of eukaryotic organisms. And so we want to look at that as a way of figuring out what genes are turned on and which ones are turned off. And so how do we control transcription? Bacteria have those operons. The lac operon, trip operon are great examples. We have something called transcription factors. And what transcription factors do is they help transcription happen. And so here's an example. If we look at this diagram, you'll see here's our gene that we're going to be expressing. Here's the promoter region. And then way further up the DNA strand, we have these two regions that are known as enhancers. So what happens is that the enhancers are going to be bound by these activator proteins. The activator proteins are then going to go in and they're going to grab all of these other proteins that kind of help in the process. What these other proteins are doing is they're bringing RNA polymerase and forcing it or allowing it to bind to that promoter region. So it's like someone taking your hand and pulling you and saying, stand right here. And that way you know who you can eat the food that's right in front of you.
So now the RNA polymerase is bound to the promoter, and now we're going to do transcription of that gene. That's what those activator proteins or transcription factors are doing. Now, what happens is we're actually coordinating what happens based on these enhancers. And so once we have done or expressed the gene, we've done transcription, now we have more control systems in the process. What we can do is alternative splicing. And what that means is that just because we have our DNA and we transcribe it, what we have to realize is that there are introns and they're in the way. And so what we want to do is we actually can take one mRNA and based on how we splice out the introns, we can actually make different RNAs. So if you look here, here's our DNA, we transcribe it and we have this RNA. From this RNA, what you'll see is that we can make this mRNA or this mRNA, each of which will lead to a different protein. Why? Based on how we have spliced it. So you can see here we've spliced out the, the, the light pink regions. And in doing so, this is the strand that we've created. And here, what we've done is we've spliced out the different light pink reg uh, regions, and we've created this mRNA. So now from one gene transcription, we're actually able to make multiple mRNA strands, each of which become its own unique protein. That's alternative splicing. Once we get to translation, we have more regulation, more controls, and this kind of helps determine what proteins are being made, how long they're around, and what they can do. One of the biggest controls that we have for translation is in order for translation to occur, we have to have mRNA. If we have mRNA and it gets broken down after a set amount of time, well, then we've stopped the production of those amino acid sequences, which turn into the protein. And so by breaking down mRNA at a set time interval, we can determine how much time we've allowed to happen in making that protein. Now, how do we start translation? One of the biggest things is that there are controls for this. And so if we look at, even after translation happens, we're going to determine whether or not that protein's ready. Proteins are not just a sequence of amino acids. They have to be folded. We have to make that three-dimensional structure. And so here's some of the kind of examples that can happen. So here's our initial polypeptide. Notice it's just made up of a sequence of amino acids. Now we're folding it to make our disulfide linkages. So these are those sulfur and sulfur bonding together. So now we're making some bonds. We've created a structure. It's folded. Well, it turns out that this structure is still not complete. We actually have to go in and cut out some of the um, amino acid sequence in order to make the correct and proper final structure that represents the protein. And in this case, it's insulin. And then again, some of the proteins actually will trigger changes in a cell get broken down. So we can break down the mRNA and stop making the protein, or we can make a protein and then eventually just break down that protein, and then that way we stop having the effect that we would have expected. So here's all the control mechanisms that can happen to regulate gene expression in a eukaryotic cell. So here's our nucleus. We have to take our chromosome. We can package or unpackage it. So if it's tightly bound, we're not able to express those genes. But let's say we've opened up a sequence of DNA and we want to express those genes. Just because we've made those genes using um, transcription factors doesn't mean we're not going to do alternative splicing. Once we have alternative splicing, what we also have to realize is that we have to add a poly A, um, a poly -A tail and the fry prime cap. So we're adding a cap or a sequence of nucleotides to the front of our mRNA, and we're going to add a poly A nucleotide tail to help prevent the breakdown. Now this kind of alternatively spliced mRNA that has the introns out is ready to go into the cytoplasm. From there, maybe we'll break down the mRNA. Maybe it'll go through translation. We'll have the cleavage modification, the activation like we saw with the insulin to produce our final protein. And then maybe even that protein will be broken down. All of these are ways that we control the expression in eukaryotic cells. That's the end of this chapter.